Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Kaya number five from Image Comics. Now, this is written and illustrated by Wes Craig, who is a fantastic comic book artist. I love his work on Deadly Class. But with Kaya, he is proving himself to be quite a capable writer. Now, Kaya has come along now five issues, but the previous four issues, each month I'm like, it's really great. It's got good artwork. It's got a little bit of, of deepness to it. It's got a little bit of adventure, and it's got this whimsy to it at times, but it's also got this sense of, of scale and threat, right? And I've been like, this book's decent, but here it is in February, whatever, 14th, that it, hey, happy Valentine's Day. But Kaya, number five, just stood out above all the other books that I read this week as being just so fantastically done. And it's been that way consistently. And it's been building that momentum up to hit a point like in issue number five, where a lot of the stuff that's been set up comes to fruition and it has the weight that it needs. You know, a lot of times on the pick of the week, you get issue number one, stuff like that. I understand it's it's easy to get excited or, 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 or thrilled or engaged by an issue number one, but when you hit issue number five and the book's just getting better and everything that's been set up has been paid off and been paid off uh, immensely well, that's top tier comics. That's actually really great stuff. Plus the artwork, it is deceptively simple looking. The uh, coloring by Jason Wordy. I am such a fan of Jason Wordy's coloring, especially in books like Wasted Space or God Country, but this might be some of the best work of Wordy's career. This is absolutely fantastic, and world design on the lettering. Everything about it, it's pitch perfect. It is a pitch perfect comic. And it's the pick of the week. So there you go. Kaya number five. Also new from Image this week, we have Torrent number one. This is written by Mark Guggenheim with artwork by Justin Greenwood, uh, colored by Rico Renzi. Like the coloring, like the artwork, like the vibe of it. But for the most part, it's a, it's an image generic -y superhero story. I mean, it's okay. It doesn't overly excel at anything, and it doesn't do anything bad. It's not a boring comic book. It just wasn't anything to stand out above an already over bloated superhero comic book market and I'm not saying anything against the book because of that but it's harder to stand out when there's so many other things out there that this was just kind of okay but it's about a mom who's also a superhero and what happens when you know things get a little too close to home right we've seen this story before and we're seeing it again, but like I said, it's it's not overly exceptional, but it's not boring. It's a rather fun comic. It has a kind of a nice pace to it. The Last Barbarians is a new one from Image. This is from Brian Haberlin and uh, Gerard Van Dyke, and and it's all right. The artwork kind of has this like three D model kind of like a stiffness to it right and it doesn't really allow the story to flow and it gets stagnated just a little bit by some of the some of the narration the dialogue's fine but the narration kind of holds it back just a little bit this is a fantasy world in which everybody has to pick one trade and you join you know that 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 guild or whatever and you can't do anything else right and it's about a woman trying to fit in i guess joining the barbarian guild or something it was all right it wasn't necessarily difficult to follow it was easy to follow it just kind of felt like because of the stiffness of some of the artwork, because of the computer modeling effect of it, and the way that the narration kind of conflicted at times through pacing issues with the dialogue, it just kind of hindered my enjoyment of this book, so I wasn't completely sold on it. Then we got 8 Billion Genies, issue number 7, the penultimate issue, and I am loving this book. Charles Soule, Ryan Brown, they have been completely winning me over month to month, on this book. It's a world where all of a sudden everybody on the planet gets a genie. Everybody starts making these crazy wishes. This book is an eight issue series. This is issue seven. The first book was like the first eight seconds, then it was like the first eight minutes, and then the first eight hours, and so on and so forth. Here we are with the first eight decades. So we get a big expansive in scope telling of 
a lot of endings for some of our characters and a lot of setup as to where this book is going to go. And a book that could have a very simple premise, an exciting premise, but kind of fall flat. Like, I don't think... Like, I think Charles Soule's a really good writer, but for the most part, I kind of fall out of his comics. That has not happened here. The way it's structured, the way he's using those ideas, the way he's building out this world further and further, issue to issue, it is amazing. And then you got the density of the artwork that helps all of those ideas come clearly across on the page. Eight Billion Genies has been one of the best books on shelves. Issue number seven is no exception, no exception. Then we got Nemesis Reloaded, issue number two from Mark Miller and Jorge Jimenez. Love Jorge Jimenez on this book. Incredibly dynamic, though this book takes a more subtle approach. We basically get the origin of Nemesis, or at least this version of Nemesis, because I've never read the original Nemesis run with Steve McNiven, right? But like, I'm under the impression this is completely new, completely new restart, but it's about this dude. He's like a vigilante. He's put a bounty on cops' heads. Like, he'll give somebody $10,000 for every cop they kill. He's trying to start this massive crime wave. You start finding out the reasons for his motivations and the origins of those all in this book. And great artwork from Jorge Menez, able to really handle those those subtle moments of drama and really kick it up when it's time to get into some action. And some of the action sequences in this book are absolutely some of the best in comics. Seriously, this is Jorge Jimenez Unleashed. And I'm having fun with it. Nightclub is here with issue number three, $1.99. I applaud that. This is written by Mark Miller. Artwork by Wanan Ramirez. Um, I like the art. I like the basic idea of the story. It's about these three teenagers they become vampires, so they use this to become superhero influencers, like on Instagram or YouTube or TikTok or something like that, right? And they're building this following, um, they're getting money, uh, they're basically heroes for hire in a way, and they're using their vampiric powers to uh, be superheroes. And that's a kind of fun approach to it, but it's not really doing anything ultra interesting. It kind of feels like your run-of-the-mill typical 80s story plotline. It feels like a Mark Miller book. He likes to take these kind of common tropes, mix it with superheroes, and then something else. So this is vampires with superheroes, a little bit of this coming-of-age story. And so you got the bullies and you got this kind of stuff. It just doesn't feel new or fresh. It just feels like a mixture of genres. And that's fine. And it's a fun comic. And it's only a $2 comic. So that's pretty cool. It's not bad, but it's not exceptional. And it doesn't give me the kind of oomph that I get out of like Nemesis Reloaded. But I think this book is dealing, I mean, I don't know, neither one of them are rather deep, let's be honest. But the artwork in both of them is great. Nightclub's fine. Nightclub's fine. I'll just say that. Then we got Gunslinger Spawn here with issue number 17. Loved this issue of Gunslinger Spawn. First of all, Brett Booth just cranking out his 90s heart. This is just a big battle between Gunslinger Spawn, this new speedster character. I cannot remember the name of the character. Is it Focus or something like that? Anyway, really like the design. Brett Booth likes his speedsters, doesn't he? Um, but I really like this. Some really exciting things happen and some interesting things happen uh, to Gunslinger Spawn at the end of this one. I don't want to spoil anything for people reading it, but... I got a kick out of it, and I had a lot of fun. So I actually am really enjoying Gunslinger Spawn. Most of the Spawn titles are super solid. Also from Image, we have Art Brute issue number three. That is my cover of the week. Um, Art Brute is a really cool book. It's from W. Maxwell Prince and Martin Marizzo, who that's the team of Ice Cream Man. Now, this was a book released by like IDW under the title Electric Sublime some years ago. They have gotten the rights back. They've retitled it Art Brute. They've added some extra bits towards the very end, and they are representing it. And I'm very glad they are because the quirky nature of Ice Cream Man, you see some of that prototypical na uh, narrative structure and style here in Art Brute. Not quite getting there, but some of those same statements that W. Maxwell Prince has been making through the pages of Ice Cream Man, you're starting to see it expressed here through art, because this is about a dude who's able to go into paintings and talk to people. There's this whole world in, 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 in art, and like, it's you know, all like the Mona Lisa's real and she gets murdered. He's trying to investigate the murder of the Mona Lisa. Somebody is destroying the actual lives of these paintings. He's able to go inside of them, interact. It's very trippy. It's very interesting. It's filled with cool ideas and art references. And I cannot get enough of this book. There's one more issue left in this re-release. And if you've never checked it out, or even if you've checked it out originally, I highly encourage you to check that out. Over at Marvel, we have X-Men Sins of Sinister Nightcrawlers. 
I'm still reading these books so far. You know, I jumped out of the X-Men books. Basically, when Hickman left, I should have left, but I stuck it out for a little bit longer. Just kind of got bored with it. Dipped out completely on X-Men books. But I did like Exterminators. And even though that's not telling me the direction of the X titles, <clears throat> with the rise of Sins of Sinister and a whole new batch of number ones, why not jump into it? An Age of Apocalypse type story where Sinister has basically uh, in, uh, in, infected all of Krakoa with little bits of himself. So now the world has been overtaken by all these differing factions of Sinisters and it's just become this big giant mess. Age of Apocalypse, but like Age of Sinister basically is what it is. Sins of Sinister. Oh, Age of Apocalypse, AA alliterative. Sins of Sinister. Just, just realize that. The X Office is a bit more clever than me, I'll tell you that. Anyway, this one is written by Cy Spurrier with artwork by, uh, is that Paco Medina? Um, the artwork's fine, it's decent, but the story just didn't really quite work for me. Um, I don't know, yeah, it's Paco Medina. I mean, the story is decent enough. It's about a team of, like, I guess they're called Chimera or whatever. They're, a, you know, Sinister's been making these amalgams of people with different powers and stuff. So they all have like this, a team of people like with Nightcrawler base power, but there's like a Spider-Man one, there's a Colossus one, there's an X-23 one, and it's all right, but it was kind of confusing. There's a lot of stuff going on that I just kind of felt lost about. Maybe I'm missing something. Cy Spurrier can be a little bit, you know, elevated in, in some of his themes some, sometimes, I guess. But, you know, Nightcrawlers just kind of bored me, didn't really wow me. I thought that the last one, The Storm and the Brotherhood, I thought that one was fine, and The Sins and Sinister One-Shot was fine. So it's not dissuading me from this, from enjoying this, because I don't like every single book in Age of Apocalypse. I don't believe I'm going to like every single book in Sins and Sinister. But I guess it's worth checking them out, right? So there you go. Murder World is back with part four of this one-shot series of five one-shots. Murder World Moon Knight. Um, Murder World started off really fun. I thought that first issue was very exciting. Two was a step down, but it was still good. Three kind of eh, didn't really work for me. Here in the penultimate Murder World one-shot, it starts working for me again. We get to elaborate a little bit more on the background of another character. She's a former, or she's actually a Hydra agent that's trying to infiltrate this, like, battle arena thing going on with arcade and i had a lot of fun with this plus there's this moon knight like lmd here and they don't know like there's this bit where they don't have any good audio from moon knight so they don't know what he's saying so they just program the most generic superhero dialogue and it's really funny so i like this murder world moon knight series or that one book as a part of the series of one shots is this is murder world one through five yeah anyway hulk here with issue number 12, Donnie Cates is off the book, but he's still credited as the co-plotter. Um, we got Ryan Otley doing the scripting and the artwork as well. Now, the artwork is fine. We're building up to the unleashing of the Titan Hulk. This is what this whole run has been built up to, and it feels like the, the power and weight of this is just getting undercut by delays and what feels like a rushed into finale just to be like, look, we're pulling Kate's off the book. Something's going down, and Otley, we need you to kind of finish it, but we are moving that story forward, but... Writing-wise, there's a lot of dialogue on some pages that really just hinder the flow of this book. Ryan Otley is an incredibly dynamic artist, and maybe just a little bit more editing of that and taking some stuff out, making it flow better with the artwork would have made this much more of a dynamic and thrilling experience. Instead, it just kind of felt a little bit dull. Exciting artwork, exciting things actually happening, but the execution of that through the dialogue really just hindered everything about that book for me. Then we got Fantastic Four issue number four. I like this book. I like it. I think Ryan North has been doing a pretty decent job. We were promised that he was going to do these like solo stories, focusing on the thing in Alicia in part one, focusing on Reed and Sue in part two, focusing on Johnny in three, and then bring it all together in four and also reveal what has happened as to why the Fantastic Four are now pariahs in New York City, why the Baxter building is gone, why they are all split apart, why Thing is not very excited and happy with Reed and Sue right now. You find out all of that here, and it's easily guessable. Me and my homie at work today were talking about it. We're like, wait, bet it's this, and it was literally what I thought it was going to be, but it still had a nice emotional punch to it, and I liked it. Ryan North understands these characters. He understands how to make them work. I've enjoyed the structure building up to this, and now that we've hit issue number four, I'm ready to see how it develops and where this goes. I think that Ryan North is capable of doing a pretty fantastic job on this book, no pun intended, actually. Um, the artwork is pretty cool. It's uh, Ivan Coelho. There is some parts of it where it just feels maybe a bit too thin or just maybe a bit too 
I don't know what the right word is. Thin's probably the right word. Maybe repetitive too at the same time. Maybe a little too early 2000s. Maybe it's got excitement. There's something, something, something. There's something about the artwork that's... Is it cluttered? I don't know. There's something there. Then we got Mary Jane and Black Cat, no longer a dark web tie-in, here with issue number three of a five-issue series. Still kind of tied into some of the themes lingering from dark web because the whole point of this book is that Black Cat is tasked with finding the, the soul sword, like stealing the soul sword for like Belasco or something like that. She's teamed up with Mary Jane to do it. Mary Jane's got like the jackpot powers, um, but they're not working. And there's a reason why that's kind of clever that gets it gets gets revealed in here. And so there's some nice kind of like tension going on. But for the most part, this was kind of a step down issue. It had a nice sense of excitement, had a nice sense of fun and flow to it. But it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't quite work as well as issue number one or two. Not that it was bad. It was all right. And I'm definitely excited to see what's going on because Jed McKay's been doing a great job with Black Cat. Hey there, everybody. Come join us here at The Experience this Monday, February 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern, it's our usual time. Um, it's really exciting because I've officially seen Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and I can't wait to talk about it. Promise no spoilers. So come join us with me and Rex and John. It's gonna be a great time. You'll see more cool books like this behind me. And again, it's gonna be fun. So remember, it's the 20th of February, Monday. It's a Monday, 6 p.m. Can't wait to see it. And holy cow, y'all. From DC Comics, we have Swamp Thing, Green Hell, Issue number two, over a year late. Swamp Thing Green Hell, number two is here by Jeff Lemire, Doug Monkey, and David Barron. Um, and it's good. It's really good. It's as good as I remember the first issue being, to be honest. It's been so long since I read that first issue, and I don't have it around, so I didn't read it. I didn't reread it. I should have. I had plenty of time to reread it. They just did a second printing last month. However, I still enjoy this book. And once I started reading it, like most Jeff Lemire books... I started remembering exactly what was going on in this book and what was happening. Basically, what's happened is that the the green, right? The 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 green, the Parliament of Trees and all the other uh, parliaments as well, like the red and, and all that stuff. They've decided that humanity, they've had enough. There's something, is there something there? There's something there. Um, anyway, so they've decided that they've had enough of humanity destroying the planet. So they are going to destroy humanity so that they can renew the earth, re rebirth it, right? And they, they create this new gnarly, monstrous avatar of Swamp Thing, and he's just destroying stuff. And John Constantine comes in, and Alec Holland is kind of like in his own little heaven area with uh, with Abby and, and their daughter. And uh, he gets pulled in to have to combat this, uh, this like, asshole Swamp Thing. And uh, that's what's going on here. But it's pretty solid. Artwork, not as intricate as it was in the first issue. Doug Monkey is a great artist. He's a veteran in this industry. This book went through a very severe delay and the artwork is not quite as tight or as intricate as it was, which means that I think that there was some kind of delay with him and I hope he's doing okay. That being said, still has this sense of power, still has the sense of mystery, and I really enjoyed it. So even if it's been, oh, even though it's been over a year, this book is good, and I'm excited to see how it wraps up in the next issue. Then we got Worlds Colliding with Icon versus Hardware, part of the milestone uh, anniversary, 30th anniversary stuff going on. The static book last week I really liked, so Icon and Rocket and Hardware combining together. This is an interesting book. It was all right. It didn't completely grab me. It didn't have as much energy or as excitement as the static book from last week did, but it did have a nice foundation, and it was very solid. Of course, we got Dennis Cowan in there doing some of the artwork. Got to meet him last year. Absolute cool dude. Uh, Reginald Hudlin, Leon Chills there, Yasmin Flores Montez, uh, there as well doing some of the artwork and it was all right there's time travel involved some of the stuff kind of feels a little bit wonky and it just kind of felt like I felt maybe a little bit more lost but I was still able to jump in and understand what we were doing but they were leaving some things un unsaid and having a basic understanding of these characters going in would probably help you out but Icon versus Hardware it was pretty decent then we got DC Universe Lazarus Planet Dark Fate another one of those one shots basically setting up the new direction of DC going forward in 2023. This one, first of all, has a Huntress story by Tim Seeley. That was not bad. I thought that was pretty decent, and that's setting up something to come. Then there is a Doom Patrol story by Dennis Culver and uh, Chris Burnham, and they're the new team on the new Doom Patrol. I really liked this Doom Patrol story. And uh, Then what else was there? There's a new character that's introduced, uh, some new character that has like a connection to the Still Force, 
that story was okay. And then the final story, what was that? Oh, yeah, it was this, uh, I think another new character setting up another new book called Spirit World or something like that, but it's got Cassandra Cain in it. It was all right. These Lazarus Planet one-shots have been kind of a mixed bag, but I don't know. I've... Part of that was enjoyable. Then we got Batman Incorporated with issue number five. I am loving what Ed Brisson and, and uh, John Timms, I believe, is doing on this book. The artwork is super kinetic. There is so much excitement in this book. It's got a great flow, right? Basically, Ghost Maker, Ghost Maker is now in charge of Batman Incorporated. And his former sidekick, who was once left for dead by Ghost Maker, has now formed an alliance with other uh, anti-Batman that were picked by Luther in the story that was set up by Josh Williamson last year. Um, and he's formed them against a team against Batman Incorporated to take out Ghostmaker and try to, like, uh, Stockholm Syndrome uh, Clown Hunter at the same time. I love this. And it concludes this story with emotion, with action, and intensity. And I love this book. It has maintained a focus on Ghostmaker, Ghostmaker's origins, on Clown Hunter, on the villain, and on the other members of Batman Incorporated. Even at one point there was an issue where I was like, it seems a little Ghostmaker heavy. Not when you read it all in all. I really, really love this book. I think it's been the best attempt at Batman Incorporated post-Morrison, for sure. Then we got Wildcats issue number four. I really liked this issue of Wildcats. Basically, you got Grifter out there on his own in a dire situation, and you got Zealot and some of the others trying to convince Marlowe to allow them to go after them. So you got some nice little fun hijinks going on there, and then you got some real serious weighty stuff going on with Grifter. It's got a great sense of action. It's got a great sense of flow, and I really do love the way that Matthew Rosenberg has reimagined these characters to fit in the DC universe. I'm still always, still not 100% sold on it being connected to the DC universe. That's just a thing I got with Wildstorm. I want it to be on its own. But Matthew Rosenberg has done a good job of kind of reinterpreting and updating this team and so honoring everything that came before the Jim Lee stuff, the, the Alan Moore stuff, the Joe Casey stuff, and just kind of tidying it up into his own thing. Batman Beyond the White Knight, issue number eight, the final issue of White Knight, and another satisfying conclusion in another satisfying chapter in the White Knight saga, and it ain't over yet because there's a promise of more at the end of this issue, and that was one of the most exciting things. There's some really cool things with the Batmobiles and what they can do here and the way that Sean Murphy actually shows that in the artwork. Some really great cartooning skills there. Really solid writing, hitting those emotional moments, hitting those action moments, and just really bringing everything to a climatic head and not have to rely on super easy, convenient tropes to actually get the job done. Batman Beyond the White Knight number eight. Loved it. Danger Street. Danger Street issue number three. I wasn't going to read this one. I thought issue number one of Danger Street is Tom King, Jorge Fornes, um, a bunch of like C-list characters uh, from the DC first specials days or whatever, right? That like, right? Um, so a bunch of like C-D-list characters that Tom King can do whatever he wants with this intricate story that's got this kind of rather pretentious structure around it where it's referring to everybody as knights and dragons and whatever, right? So the first issue was okay. Second issue I did not like. Third issue, really liked it. I almost wish I didn't read it. <laughs> if this series goes south for me, I'll wish I did not read this issue. But I did like this issue because for a big chunk of this issue, there is a rather cool and intense conversation with Highfather, Darkseid, and Metron. And I am really digging the way that Tom King is writing these characters and makes them feel epic in scope and not... Ra There's still this sense of the mundane that you really get in Tom King's work, but it actually works for me here. And I think narratively, the structure works and flows a lot better with issue number three. So I thought this was the best issue of Danger Street yet. Is it turning the corner? We'll see. Masters of the Universe, Masterverse, issue number one. <coughs> this is a book... <coughs> Excuse me. This is a book written by Tom or Tim Seeley, but it's got a few different stories with different art and it's kind of all over the place artistically, but that's one of the fun bits of it. But it is just a, got a framing story, and it's an excuse to show the multiverse of Masters of the Universe, right? Other versions of He-Man. So you get a story involving Spidor by Kelly Jones. That was a treat to behold. And then you get one that's, and look at the Kelly Jones artwork, right? Story-wise, they were all right. They were solid enough. Um, but then you got Sergio Aragones 
doing one that is straight pulled from like the earliest interpretations of Motu, which would be like, you know, the very early mini comics and stuff where He-Man was not Prince Adam, Sorceress was different. Like, I really appreciated that. So Kelly Jones and, and Sergio doing he Motu. I had I had to. I had to. I mean, there you go. Dahlia in the Dark, issue number three, written by our good buddy Joe Corallo. Such a fantastic book. And uh, you all know that I'm friends with Joe, and I'm a mark for him. And I can tell you that this is an incredibly well-paced comic. It's got a great sense of flow. It's got a cool concept. It's taken, like, like a crime story. It's taken elements of, like, fairy tales and fantasy. And it's kind of doing something really cool with that that still feels very good grounded and gritty and, and, and real to action and crime movies, but still has that fantastical element to it as well. I could really talk about that, but you probably wouldn't believe me. So what I will do is just talk about how amazing the freaking artwork is in this book by Milana. And then Myers, Micah Myers on the, uh, the lettering, fantastic. And the story does take some turns here. I'm really enjoying this book. It's Andrea Milana. The artwork in this book is insane. Look at that. It's insane. Dahlia in the Dark, issue number three, out this week. Then we got Mosley here with issue number two from Rob Guillory, from Sam Lofty, Jean-Francois Ballou, um, and Boom Studios, issue number two. Uh, issue number one made Pick of the Week. This is the second runner-up for Pick of the Week, but it is the smell of the week. There's something about this book in particular, the Buffy Vampire Slayer book that came out this week has the same type smell, but this one's the better book. Oh my goodness, but I really like this book. It's kind of a retelling of the Moses story, but through a world, a science fiction world, in which our artificial intelligence has taken over society. They've declared themselves gods. They are actively oppressing us, but it's a willful, oppressive nature or, or environment. And then you got this one dude who's just tired of it, and he winds up being called by like a higher power. Still a mystery about that. And his name is Mosley. It is the Moses story. That is what is going on. And it's a cool interpretation of it. Rob Guillory does a great job here telling the story, building these characters. And it's got this core of family. Someone just cue Vin Diesel to pop in. Uh, but Sam Lofty's artwork is absolutely fantastic. I thought that was great. From Aftershock, we got one of those graphic novels. This is a $7.99 comic, complete self-contained story by Colin Bunn and Rodrigo Saez. It's a foulness in the walls. It's a story about this dude who buys a new house. His mother just recently died. He was taking care of her for a long time while she was slowly dying. He's bought this decrepit house. He's living there alone. His life is actually starting to go good. He's starting to find romance. He's starting to find a job. But he's got this nasty stench that's coming from his house that's permeating his entire existence. He becomes obsessed with it, and then there's a twist at the end. I think the twist could have been a little bit more, right? A little bit more harder, a little bit more stabby. It was just kind of okay, but it did have a great flow. It did not take long to read at all. And if you're into Cullen Bun, you're into horror stories that have a nice little twist at the end, you might maybe want to check that one out. Also by Colin Bunn, we have Door to Door, Night by Night from Vault Comics, issue number three. I liked this issue. Um, this story is going in places where I wasn't expecting it, right? It's about this group of friends, uh, this group of people who go door to door trying to sell like like, I don't know, like raffle tickets for the fire department or something. This is how they make their money. This is what they do. But they keep coming up across these really odd occurrences, right? And they're dealing with these like, they're inside this giant mushroom that's making everybody trip and see goblins, and then they're real goblins, and it's really interesting. And I love the uh, the artwork by uh, Sally Santorino, or Santorino, and I really like Colin Bunn's story here. There's a little bit of, of, of nuance with some of the backgrounds of the characters. It's not overly stated, but it's kind of just laid there in certain moments, so I really like the vibe of this story, and it, it's kind of way more fun than I thought it would be. And then we got Cherish issue number four from Dynamite. This is written by Katana Collins, um, and also packaged by her buddy Joe Corallo. This is a really cool, interesting character. Her father was killed in a world of corporate espionage, right? She, he was killed for his technology. He's got this nanotechnology. That's why she can 
have all these cool like weapons and gliders and stuff that are uh, fueled by by nanotechnology lots of twists in the story here i enjoy this book i think it's fun it's an interesting character interesting concept and definitely something i'd like to see in an action figure line at some point so that's what i read that's what i thought about it cherish has been pretty decent can we get some action figures imagine the accessories door to door night by night way more fun than i anticipated it being a foulness in the walls was decent but it could have had a little bit more punch at the end mosley number two Smell of the Week, Contender for Pick of the Week, really did like that. Dahlia in the Dark, don't believe me about Joe in this story? Read it for the artwork, because the artwork is absolutely amazing. Masters of the Universe, Masterverse, didn't really like the stories that much with the setup, but Kelly Jones, Sergio Aragones doing Motu, I mean, come on. Danger Street, really good issue. Will I regret it in the future? We shall see. Batman Beyond the White Knight, a very awesome conclusion there with a great setup for what's to come. Wildcast number four, one of the best uh, paced issues of that yet. Batman Incorporated just continues to rock. Lazarus Planet, kind of good, kind of dull. Icon uh, versus Hardware, it was decent, but a little hard to get into. Swamp Thing Green Hell, is it worth the wait of over a year? Probably not, but it's still good. Mary Jane versus and Black Cat, it's just okay. Fantastic Four was really cool. I like how it's tying all those threads together. Hulk, exciting visually not exciting with the words there murder world moon knight really like that one had some funny bits night crawlers kind of boring on me then we got art brew cover of the week for me really liked it gunslinger spawn some interesting developments there some great 90s style artwork nightclub is just all right but i'm having a lot of fun with nemesis reloaded eight billion genies continues to impress me continues his because continues to impress me. Last Barbarians didn't really impress me. Torrent was all right, but in a sea of all right superhero books, it definitely didn't stand out. But Kaya gets the pick of the week because it's been building consistently, just like 8 Billion Genies. That's another top book of the week. But Kaya has just done a great job <clears throat> of maintaining a level of quality and building on it and letting things pay off and letting things have weight to them and letting things have a free movement and nothing about this book ever feels like it's a bogged down experience. So that's what I'm reading. That's what I'm thinking. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups and join us over at patreon.com slash PCP if you want to help support the channel. Otherwise, just like, share, and subscribe. That's all the support we need. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station. Pop, pop. Boom. <laughs>